Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Mark. I work at the St. Matthew's Rainbow Blossom, and um, I'm here today to do a little fall, uh, a fall cooking uh, class for you. And uh, what I wanted to do today was something that was simple, quick, from relatively quick as far as recipes go. It, uh, it reheats really well, so you could do some batch cooking of it, uh, and also utilizes a lot of vegetables. Because um, I think all of us, no matter what our dietary needs, wants, restrictions are, we all need more vegetables. So it's, this is a really easy way to use vegetables that are in season throughout the fall and winter or, or storage uh, throughout the fall and winter um, in a way that's really easy. It, it, it's, uh, it's a good way to get folks who don't want to eat a lot of vegetables an easier way to use them. So this is a butternut squash lasagna that I'm, do, uh, that I'm doing. I've been making a variation of this for years. Um, actually, to give credit where credit is due, the original idea from this and most of the content of this, it comes from a, um, a website called Health Bent, um, H-E-A-L-T-H -E Bent, B-E-N-T, um, and it's their, it's their uh, paleo butternut squash lasagna. And I like this recipe because no matter what dietary restrictions people have, it can be modified very easily for that. Uh, this recipe, because of the paleo recipe by nature, doesn't have dairy in it, um, you know, I, I tend to always use Parmesan as, a, as just a topping at the very end after cooking, uh, but not necessarily an ingredient in the recipe. You certainly could add ricotta or cheeses or, um, in there to make it more of a traditional lasagna if you wanted that added in, in there, or you could add some eggs even if you want to keep it dairy free to help it maybe bind together like a traditional lasagna. But I think it's perfect as it is, and I just use the Parmesan, either the vegan version or the dairy version as just a topping at the end for a little garnish doesn't really need that either. But um, what, so the, the, the basis of this is gonna be butternut squash. You can see here if you're not familiar. Um, there's a lot of winter squash varieties out there um, and, and tons of different ways you could use them. I would say the ones I utilize most would be butternut. Um, spaghetti squash, because that can be baked and then um, the flesh used almost like a pasta replacement. Um, acorn squash, I do a lot stuffed. Um, that's where you, you would bake it and then scoop out the flesh, mix it with the filling, and then bake it back in the skin. Um, the one that I like most that most people, a lot of people are not familiar with is delicata squash. I like that because it's, it's, it's for all of us who are really lazy because you don't have to peel it. Um, all, all you do with delicata is you just turn the stem ends off, scoop the, uh, cut it in half, scoop the seeds out, and, and you could, uh, people make french fries out of it. You can just, you know, scoop it, um, bake it as it is, but it's nice because you don't have to peel it. Because for some folks, that is the hardest part of winter squash is the peeling and the cutting, especially if you don't have a lot of upper body strength or things like that, it is, it can be, you know, more difficult. But with a lot of winter squash recipes, you don't have to peel them necessarily if you're using the flesh or something like a butternut squash soup. You can just cut it in half, scoop the seeds out, roast it whole, and then scoop the flesh out. The same way you do with spaghetti squash. It doesn't have to be roasted, so you could also steam it. Um, but for this, because we, we're doing a lasagna, um, doing sort of a mock, pasta sheet with this, we do need to peel it so we can have these, these little, little strips. Um, so when I'm doing a butternut squash or something like this, um, probably not a couple seconds, one, but basically I would cut right at the, at the top stem and then cut the bottom, giving a nice flat bottom and then removing this because it's really hard to cut through the whole thing if this is attached. So once, once those were off, I would just put the tip of the knife in and just, um, sort of press down, like lever down on it like this. And that will generally um, generally get through it pretty easily. Um, if, it's, if it's been stored for a while and dried out a little bit, maybe a little harder, but as always, you're keeping the knife blade away from you. And so your hand on this side, your knife blade on this side, and you're in, 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 not stabbing, but, you know, but more or less like pushing down so it's into the flesh and then levering down. And that'll help you sort of do one half and then you can flip it around to the other, the other half. So a lot of folks who don't have as much upper body strength can do it pretty easily that way. And then once it's in half, I will usually separate the bulb in from the, from the top end. Uh, so leaving you basically like this. And then, and then the peeling, uh, it's, it's easier to peel it, I feel it like when it's in this, because it kind of gives you two steady bases to work from. And the only thing you have to do is, you can see that I have already, I've already peeled this half, but I didn't get the seeds out. And just with, with anything else, just a spoon just to get the seeds out is, is the best way to do this. Um, as with any um, spoons, make great utensils. 
And one of my favorite uses for a spoon in the kitchen that I always, some people don't know about, if you ever buy ginger, fresh ginger, this is how you peel ginger. You just use, you just use the front of the spoon, let you get in all the nooks and crevices, and you're not wasting a lot of it by trying to peel it with a knife or a vegetable peeler. This is the best peeler for ginger. But also, you know, that's, that's just a little side note that I always like to pass along. So that leaving you, so that is seated. Um, and then, get rid of these seeds really quick. And then that leaves you the, the, uh, the two pieces to peel, I'm not peel, to slice into the sheets for the pasta. This here. All right, so the best way that I do is if you're not comfortable with knives, the kitchen knives, just take your time and keep your hand, you know, only cut away from you. That seems obvious, but if you just be focused on that. And so how I would do it is basically uh, put it up. I have a nice, nice flat bottom. This is the top part portion. Um, and I'm just holding it firmly and just cutting as little of the skin as you can get off. Um, there is a little white layer that's underneath the actual skin that I probably usually try to get off too, just taking you down to that deep orange color. Um, if you ever get a winter squash that's not as deep orange, it's still edible. It's just they've not let it ripen long. Um, I had an acorn squash the other day that was pretty light flesh. It still tasted fine, but it didn't have as much winter squash taste to it. So uh, I'll just go through and peel this really quickly. And this is actually a pretty low uh, like um, utensil use kind of dish too, because it really, it uses one pan and then a baking dish and then a cutting board and a knife. So it's, you're not, you're not eating dirty. Well, I guess the food processor or blender, whatever you're gonna blend the sauce up with. So it's more or less three items, which is not too bad in the grand scheme of recipes. So once I have these two, like these two peeled bits here, I'm just going through and making, I said in the recipe a quarter to an eighth inch, as thin as you can get them and have them be consistent. If they're not perfect, it doesn't matter. It's just gonna bake up inside of it anyways. Um, and I, because the bottom, um, the bottom section has that big crevice in there for seeds, um, I tend to use those pieces sort of jigsaw puzzle together down in, um, in the dish. And then I save the nice slices for the top layers that you're actually gonna see. I mean, even if you're just serving it for yourself, might as well, might as well look nice. Because you do eat with your eyes, so it should look as nice as you can do that. I'm probably going to have enough. I don't, I don't know if I'm going to need to use the space, so I'm just going to finish slicing this top part. Um, in this recipe, it, it says that it makes an, uh, a, a nine inch pan. Uh, neither one of the pans I'm using today are nine inch, so you can, it, it certainly will um, fill a larger pan. And I kind of like my lasagna to be, you know, my traditional lasagna to be kind of thinner anyways. Um, so, but it's, it's whatever pan this will fit in for you. Um, you just may have to bake it longer in the, you won't have as much like crispy edges, that kind of thing. Which I... All right, so I got these bits all. So now that I have most of the butter nuts, uh, squash here, sliced into these thin slabs, I'm gonna push this off to the side for the moment. Let's get our, sorry, let's get our, our filling done. Um, so in the meat version, if someone's gonna do a meat version, um, and my the recipe I have back here is maybe slightly different than what's on the site. I mean, we'll get that fixed if it's, if it's not. What I like to do is when I'm doing the meat version is I like to just use whatever ground meat that I'm, that I, you know, whatever farm that I like to get it from and things like that. And then I just add my own seasonings. Lots of people make pre, you know, pre-made Italian sausage, you know, be it pork or chicken or turkey. There's all kinds of options. I just find a lot of that to be kind of salty. So I'd rather just add my own seasonings. And on the recipe, that if it's not on there, we'll, we'll put that on there. I just add my own seasonings to ground meat that I buy. Uh, this is a farm that I like locally. It's it's a woodland farm. Um, so if you're interested in pork, this is the best pork locally. It's pastured, heritage breeds. They live outside doing big things, you know, their whole lives. So it, it's not you know, so it's really a very legitimate pasture raised farm. If you're not uh, you don't need meat. Sorry about that, but that's just my tip for that. Um, and when it comes to the seasoning, um, this is sort of a little bit of rainbow blossom plug here, but uh, never forget that we have bulk herbs. This lets you 
make your own, your, you know, your own recipes that you stumble across in a way that's a little bit more manageable. Because sometimes if, you, if, you know, if a recipe that you find calls for a spice, you don't need to buy a $6 jar of spice you're gonna use once. You can come in and buy as little or as much from our bulk herb section. And we still have this open during COVID. We just, uh, we just have a little bit different process than prior to this, but uh, this is still an option with us. All of our, all of our stores, even here at the Wellness Center that doesn't really have much in the way of groceries, does have bulk herbs. It's so much more affordable. We sell tons of them, so they're very fresh. This is the way to do this. And that's, that's actually how I I've, how I've made a little spice one that I have for, uh, for the Italian sausage season. And it's the same seasoning blend, whether you're using the mushroom version of this or using the meat version of this. It's the same amount. You may want to alter the quantity a little bit, but honestly, I think it's, this should be for the, for the for mushroom quantity, the same amount for the, uh, for the meat. Um, so um, we have cremini mushrooms. I, there's tons and tons of mock meat options out there, vegetarian meat substitutes. A lot of them are taste really nice. I tend to lean a little bit more toward whole foods in the sense of, I don't think things need to come from factories. Like there's a lot of great food out there that is vegetarian that doesn't have to come from a giant factory recreating something. So that's why I think for vegetarian dishes, I do a lot of, I do a lot of mushroom things because mushrooms are kind of meaty and you can get local ones. So you want to, if, if like sustainability is an issue with you, it's like they're local and it's not from a factory, it's from like, you know, from a farmer that you can, you can actually talk to. Um, and they taste great too. So, and obviously someone has a mushroom allergy or some aversion to mushrooms, use whatever meat substitute you want to use. But I just like mushrooms because they're just food. It's not some sort of amalgamation of factory processing and stuff. So um, I happen to use, in this, i uh, going to use carminis, but you can use any mushroom that's, you can even use white mushrooms if you want. There's nothing wrong with white mushrooms. I just, there's not as, not as tasty to me. Um, that was interesting, but um, yeah, there's um, oysters, you know, portobellos even, I guess. Um, probably wouldn't use shiitakes for this because they have a little bit different texture that's not gonna quite, you know, work the same way. But, and whenever I do mushrooms, something out, especially uh, like factory ones, because um, local mushrooms a lot of times raise on, on wood, but um, when you're buying more commercial mushrooms, be it organic or conventional or anything like that, um, they are generally raised on sterilized manure, so you will want to clean them well. Um, but please, please, please don't ever run mushrooms under water because mushrooms are a sponge. So if you're if you are doing you know if you're if you're rinsing under water to get that grown medium off of there, um, you'll definitely be adding a lot more water to the dish. And what we're trying to do in making up this Italian sauce sausage substitute is we're trying to remove water to make it more meaty and more, more chewy and kind of concentrate flavors. So you're only going to make the process work, you know, harder. And you're also, um, and you're also um, maybe even pushing some things into the mushrooms that, you, that you're trying to get off because they, they, they do absorb. And this is just a rough chop. This is, doesn't have to be pretty because, because, because like they're going to get broken up in the pan anyways. Speaking of this oil, um, I don't ordinarily cook with olive oil, olive oil. This is it. Olive oil should, in my opinion, in a lot of people's opinions, should just be a, a finishing oil. But for right now, this is what I've got. So this is what we're using. But at home, um, I would generally cook with a, um, if, I want, if I want oil that's liquid at room temperature, that's not saturated, I would generally cook with avocado. Um, macadamia nuts also heat stable. Um, those are the only two oils that are, um, stable to heat, um, but are not um, either overly refined or don't uh, don't contain very very high amounts of omega sixes. Because that's one of um, we talk about inflammation being a lot of an issue with almost all modern diseases, and one of the biggest sources of inflammatory foods are seed and vegetable oils. Uh, and so, whenever you're cooking with something, generally. Um, something that's saturated at room temperature, it's solid, right? solid room temperature is the most stable cooking fat because they are, uh, that they're highly saturated. And, and the more saturated the oil is, uh, it's, it's stable longer as far as storage, but it's also stable to heat. Um, so, uh, you know, vegetarian options or vegan options for, um, for safer, healthier cooking oils that are, that are heat stable would be like your coconut, your palms, things like that. Um, and the, or the animal-based ones like ghee, you can cook with ghee, 
can cook with you know animal fats like tallow and lard. Those are all heat stable fats that um, are not omega six rich. So, uh, all right. So uh, I'm going to set this set the stove to to, to to just over medium for these. And uh, well, like I said earlier, all we're going to be doing is just trying to sort of um, break these down and sort of drive the drive the, the, the moisture off of them. So. Um, as you can see, it's just a super rough job on this. Um, do a little bit of cleanup here, and I'll be right back. And then once we get these mushrooms in the pan, we're going to start working on our greens. Um, I chose chard for this just because um, everyone's been so obsessed with kale for so long. Everyone's worn out on kale, um, so I'm just trying to mix the greens up a little bit. Now, um, you don't have chard quite as late into the season, like. Um, so you may not be able to get this if you're looking to you know, keep this pretty local. Um, you can definitely get kales almost all winter long because a lot of farmers will do um, hoop houses. So even if there's, if there's snow on the ground, there, there's a good chance you may be able to like, source like local greens. Chard is a little bit more delicate than that, but it, it goes pretty late into the year as far as having access to it. Um, look at these mushrooms in the pan here. And um, I'm not going to put any salt in these until um, until they are to the tech. Honestly, uh, probably until I mix them in, uh, before I put them in the lasagna, um, just because um, I want them to brown before you know uh, brown before they start releasing too much water, and you just won't get that because um, adding the salt will cause the cell walls and mushroom to start to break down and start to release water. So I'm just going for trying to break those down. Now, as, uh, as or sorry, not breaking down. Brown them, get some, get some, get some browning on them before they start releasing too much. Food. So I'm just gonna let those sit and not stir them too much right now. We move on to the char. Um, so this is char. If you're not familiar with it, there's multiple kinds. Uh, red, there's reds, or yellows, and oranges. A lot of times you'll see mixed ones, which will just have different varieties bundled together. They don't. Uh, my understanding is they don't grow that way. They just that's more of how they do at the factory. Uh, so as with any greens, I'm just going through and making sure that anything that doesn't look something that I want to eat, uh, I'll, I'll pull the little, little bits off. Um, just kind of inspecting them because, you know, for bugs and things, because uh, this is, this is our, our organic produce. So there is a chance and a lot of folks don't want to eat bugs, especially if you're going for a vegetarian option. So, and with chard, um, I will keep most of the stem on these. Um, if there's a ton of stem at the end here, you know, like, um, like I may cut it off like at the beginning of the, of the leaf, but generally uh, I, it, it's all edible. And so if this was kale, um, I would generally go through and run and run my knife just behind this, obviously on the cutting board, just behind this to like remove that, that kind of hard rib that's in kale uh, or collards, but you don't really have to do that so much with chard. And honestly, it gives a little a little more texture to it because chard being a little bit more of a delicate uh, leaf uh, breaks down a little bit more than your hardier greens. So having that rib in there helps with texture. Um, also, since we're just wasting uh, wasting your time watching me cut this up, uh, so it's, uh, like something else we could really talk about really quickly um, is is green selection, vegetable selection. Um, People tend to think that they eat a fairly varied diet, but what you, but really what you notice, if you're sort of looking at the, where a lot of the plants that we eat came from, um, if you're eating kale, broccoli, turnips, collards, um, there's a few other things in there, um, cauliflower, I say that, uh, those are all the same plants. Now they have been morphed in different ways, but when it comes down to it, you are essentially getting very similar nutrients, and you're also getting similar anti-nutrients. And that's not a word we, we, we hear about much, but um, like say folks that have issues with their, issues with their thyroids, um, there's, a, there's a chemical that's in what are called cruciferous vegetables, which are broccoli, coll you know, collards, all the things I've mentioned in numerous other ones um, that are really hard on the thyroid. So if your diet, if you already have a thyroid issue or you're susceptible to that, um, and your diet is just a tons of the same thing all the time, that may be potentially doing you more harm than good if, you know, so if that's a sole source of the greens, if like, well, I mean so many different types where they have thyroid issues, that's really not something they should be eating all the time. 
and, and also uh, not having it raw or not having it fermented. A cabbage is another one. So if somebody who has um, thyroid issues should be a little cautious with eating tons of, tons of cabbage sauerkraut or tons of coleslaw or tons of like raw broccoli and things like that because cooking it does um, denature some of those what are called goitrogenic compounds. But by using different types of greens like chard, uh, chard is different a few different species. Um, so doing that is nice because you're mixing up your, your anti-nutrient consumption um, and you're getting some different nutrition. So I'm going to uh, rinse this board off and rinse this, um, this chart. Right back. Okay, so these mushrooms are, are, are um, getting some nice color on them and, and starting to lose a little bit of moisture. I probably should have done this earlier, but I'm going to go ahead and add the seasonings. Because um, there's no salt in this, this is just the um, just the herbs and the spices that were um, that were in um, that are on the recipe. And actually, um, the recipe calls for uh, two packages of mushrooms. So I only did one just for the sake of this, but it's two packages of mushrooms, um, or one pound, however you however you tune the vibe in. Um, So uh, let's get on to the sauce while that's finishing up. So the sauce is, is very specific and it's kind of strange in the sense of um, you can definitely vary, you know, the brand or whatever of red peppers because this is, so the sauce only contains three ingredients. It contains a jar of mirglin, sorry, a jar, a can of mirglin pizza sauce, oddly specific, but this, this, this is kind of what should be used for it. Um, half a jar of red peppers. These happen to be the strips, but if you have the big ones, it doesn't matter because you're going to blend it. And then last, a quarter cup of olive oil. And blending that together, it makes a, um, the olive oil adds a nice, um, a really nice uh, kind of almost creaminess to it and it's sort of richness and it's blended. So it's, it kind of gets emulsified a little bit in there. Um, the red pepper and the, and the pizza sauce uh, together, just, they, it just works, especially well with a little bit of this butter and squash. So all I'm going to do is just blend those in a food processor. You could use a blender. Uh, you could use an immersion blender, just something to, these are all soft ingredients. You don't have to have some sort of like expensive um, Vitamix to make this work. You could you probably chop it if you didn't have one of these. I don't know, that wouldn't be quite the same, but you could probably do a relatively good job with that. So I know it's oddly specific using this pizza sauce, but this is, this is actually really good. Like, uh, like anytime I, I make homemade pizza, this is what I use. The and then the, uh, the red peppers, you are gonna drain those and bring them to real quick. And you, and you don't have to get them bone dry, just, you know, dryish. So add those together. Um, and then a quarter cup of olive oil. All right, and this just gets blended uh, very quickly here. And so I can figure out how to use this. Uh, Just, a, just, a, just a, a pretty smooth blended sauce like that. And it, it ends up being a little bit kind of orangish pink, which is just one of the olive oil and same things that are in there. And now we're gonna move on to our last component before we assemble this. And we're gonna get our, um, uh, our greens going. One second. So we get the mushrooms out of this pan here so All right, so um, one onion in this dish. And, um, I, th I think a lot of people feel a little uncomfortable at cooking just because like knife skills to some people are, are very um, scary. But really it's just, it's just like, how I, uh, like knowing how to approach each vegetable, like an onion. Um, 
So some folks say that you should, you should leave the, um, the actual root end on. I find that to be a little more trouble than it's worth. If you're in culinary school and need to, uh, and are looking to have perfect cuts, sure, do that, but we're not. So I would generally do root end off and then do the stem end off, leaving you with a nice flat basis to cut. Cut it in half and then use your fingers just to peel. And you'll wanna get, some people feel like it's too much, but I, I wanna get that, that very outer um, oniony, no, leathery um, top layer off too. So I'll take the papery and then one layer underneath that usually. Unless it's a really small onion, then I might leave that, but generally I take it off. And then once you, get it in half. Um, I will generally um, run, we'll go this direction, usually twice. And then that'll give, that'll, that'll give a nice small dice because you're breaking up those layers of the onion in a way that give you a nice small dice. It's not a, this is not professional kitchen here, but it's, this is just a way to have easy and consistent cutting. So you saw, you saw me slice it that way and then do two slices in always keeping my hand away from the blade. And then once it's to that, just going down through it, doing, doing a dice this way. You've probably seen, uh, uh, you know, an onion cut a million times, but I just, you know, some people, some people don't, don't hear this enough that you can do it. So you, you, you can do it. Um, just putting a little bit more olive oil in the, into this pan. Uh, we're gonna soften these onions and uh, wilt these greens, and then we'll, then we'll be assembling. It's it's pretty it's pretty quick. Um, if I'm not if I'm not yammering on and doing this at home, it takes me about 15 minutes to do this. Um, the it's definitely cleanup time is a little bit longer than the actual preparation. So, and I will be using this whole onion in this. Outside of cutting it, it's like. The, that's really the most intimidating thing for most people just because you don't really know what to do with it. But it's, um, if you don't mind the, the peeling part of it, it really, you know, it's really great, like roasted with just some olive oil and some things, you know, 375, maybe 40 minutes, kind of in the oven. Um, you, you could add you know, your other wintry vegetables to go along with it or, um, or just roasting it whole and then, and then using that. Uh, so like, you know, butternut squash soup is perfect in the winter. And, you know, you can make it vegetarian, you can use chicken broth, and you, you can use cream if you'd like. But it's, it, it's like once that's roasted, it didn't just get, it becomes just, uh, just blending it up. It's just kind of nice. So, um, I do have one. I have one in the oven right now um, that's, that's going to be coming out here in a moment. Um, just, I, 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 this one you have kind of a visual. visual on what, what it looks like finished. All right. So um, as with any lasagna, um, it's just gonna be a layering process once these, these components are done. Um, and I will put a layer of sauce in the bottom, as you do with most lasagnas, uh, just keep it from sticking. A lot of times you will do that with lasagna too, because that will, um, Help to help to cook those noodles because it will absorb some of the moisture. This you're not really doing that because most all the cooking is just happening um, um, without those butternut squash absorbing too much of the liquid. But it's uh, it's simmer, it's it's definitely simmering nicely in there. And um, I put that one in just before we started this, so it's getting very close to. Me. So once the onions start to sweat down a little bit, um, that's when I'll go ahead and I'll probably crank this heat up a little bit just for, uh, just for time. And also because uh, once, the, once the chard goes in there, there's a lot of moisture that needs to kind of be evaporated off of that to break those greens down. And, and unlike the mushrooms, I will salt this um, 
now because I because I wanted to start expressing a lot of water. Not just salt. We've got some 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 pink Himalayan salt here, keeping it very fancy. And because um, I'm not adding a lot of salt to to many other things, if if, if I will, if you see me adding extra salt in this, it's not. It shouldn't be too much of an issue just because um, I did not add any to the mushrooms. Um, you can certainly do that in the pan um, because in other uh, other components, you do have a, a packaged tomato product which runs a little high on the salt and then add some salt to that. You probably don't really need to add to the mushrooms per se. Um, all right, so. We go ahead and, and, and put our put our initial layer of the tomato sauce and uh, in the first layer of butternut squash down at this bottom. So just like any other lasagna, um, I tend to go a little light on the layers of sauce in the middle, um, just because I kind of mentioned earlier with the um, with using the, the flat pieces of the squash. Um, I save it a lot for the top because it will obviously run down through the dish when it's cooking, and that way I have a nice coverage on the top for my own presentation. Um, we, will, uh, we will be adding some garlic to these greens and onions here. Um, I tend to do that a little bit later, like after things have started really on their way, because garlic has such a tendency to burn so easily that I tend to wait until the end. And when I when I do garlic, I'll usually I'll cut the the the, the root end off or, or the end that sort of binds it to the bulb. And then I'll just smash it with the back of the knife. And that way, then the, um, the skin will, just, will come right off in one piece. Um, some people I know will chop up that root end. I don't, I've, I've never been able to get that smooth enough for my liking, so that's how I do it. And as with the onions, this is just gonna be a rough chop. It's not gonna have to be any, um, no, one's, no one's grading your culinary knife skills in this. And it said four cloves, oh, sorry, it said three cloves in the recipe. I just happened to grab four. It's a really rough chop. Make sure you get all the skin in it. Most greens are, well, they're, they're well on their way. Um, so I'm going to start assembling this. Um, and all I'm, all I'm looking for is just a softening of everything. Um, it's definitely with, with the chard, um, it starts out in such a volume that you don't want to have it to be um, too undercooked before it goes in, because then it doesn't seem to, you know, uh, become a really great part of this. It's, sort of stands out. So I want it to all kind of be one uniform lasagna. So that's doing its thing. So when it comes to the layering, I always do, um, I always, I think I mentioned this earlier, I always do the sort of weird inside pieces that have the little, um, that have the little um, sort of, moon shape. I'll just kind of interlace those down in the dish. I um, mean, that way it, it takes up the space as if you're using a sheet, but um, no one's going to see this anyways because it's inside. Save the nice flat pieces for the top. And this is just getting as many pieces of the squash in there as you can. There is no waste of anything. A little, a little jigsaw puzzle, kind of, where you can cheat by cutting edges off. Um, and I will usually go for um, four layers of squash in here. And for a pan this size, that, that, should, that shouldn't be an, uh, shouldn't be an issue with the, with the amount of squash that I've cut. Um, and I will say, this is a little bit larger onion than I would use, generally use, because uh, this is probably a more of a small onion dish, but I'm gonna end up the whole thing in here, so a little more onion than I usually make. But 
And so, um, because we're gonna have three layers of filling, I just use about a third of the, the greens and onion mixture. And then about a third of the... About a third of the mushroom. And um, like I indicated, I uh, only did half the amount of mushrooms. That's just how all I thought we'd have time for. But um, we usually have twice the amount of mushrooms here. So act like there's more in this layer. And then, and then on to just using up more of the squash. And once you get into these neck pieces, it really does go a lot more quickly. Um, just in, um, I tend to, I tend to uh, save the overlapping for the very top, but if there's a little bit of overlapping on these, it's totally fine. Um, and if you're feeling comfortable with the cutting process, the thinner that you can get these layers, in my opinion, the better. I'm gonna pull the one we've got in the oven out because I do want to set the one. Um, so then so we have a layer of sauce, a layer of squash, filling, another layer of squash, then onto, I keep, uh, like I kind of mentioned earlier, I keep the layer, the, the tomato sauce in the middle, relatively minimum, just because I want to make sure I have a good coverage on the very top. Because that is, um, you can certainly cover this. I don't find it necessary to cover it because so much moisture does come out of the squash. It's not really going to dry out internally, but if you don't have enough sauce on top, cover the butternut squash bits, you uh, may have some burning of that. So back to another third of the, of the greens and onions. Spread this out. And I am definitely pressing down a little bit because um, the volume of this does is a little high right now. As it softens, it will, will flatten out some. Or you could also just use, like I mentioned earlier, a, a little bit larger pan. Right. Now a nice layer of that, and then one more. One more layer of the, of the vegetable. And fishing out this as uniform as we can. And I did not put a layer of tomato sauce on this one, on the, in between these two, because I will finish with this. And I mentioned earlier, I've been making this for a lot of years. Um, if someone, actually, this will work either way, but um, a lot of folks will do uh, what are called Whole30, which is sort of like diet reset things that are, um, have been popular on and off over the years. Definitely, it's, for a lot of people, it becomes their like New Year's resolution type, um, type sort of dietary thing to get their year started uh, correctly or restarted, I should say. Um, and, and, and this is actually a whole 30 recipe um, it's because it really does, it, uh, it like hits all the, the requirements for, for, um, for doing that diet, but it is so adaptable um, that you could, you could really make this to fit anyone's needs. Um, and it really is a nice, um, a nice comforting winter dish that's, it's a great way to get a lot of vegetables and people because there's, there is no grains in here and there's no, you know, unless you choose to add it, there doesn't have to be any dairy in this. Um, and it, 
and to really stick with, if you're sticking through the, to the letter of the law, someone's doing a whole 30, you would just uh, leave out the, uh, the Ramajan because they, they say no dairy replacements because it's a strict paleo reset kind of thing. But um, even, even, the, even for the meat version myself, I will generally choose Ramajan. Um, Sarah, who's, who's here with me, she likes it. She likes the uh, the Via Life. Um, so this is a this is a this is a vegan Parmesan that you would grate with your handy microplane. Um, or and, and, and this is the one that I've used. This is like like I said earlier. Whatever fits your needs, use that. I just like this because like I I can make this at home. This is just uh, nuts and nutritional yeast and salt. So, but obviously it's pre-made for me for convenience. But I like this just because of it's, it's minimally processed. And I like the way it tastes, probably because I've eaten it for so long. Um, but the, this is another great option. Um, definitely technology has, has given a lot of people who choose to eat vegan or plant-based or whatever diets, things that mimic dairy products or meat products in very good ways. And it's, it's come a long way. I was, I was, uh, I was vegan for a, almost a, a, about a decade, but this has been a long time ago. Things are very different there now, like the quality uh, and the taste of, of a lot of the vegan things are not what they used to be. So they really are, they really are fantastic. Now, it's just one example of that. Um, yeah, so now that it's all done, um, like I said, I don't feel the need to cover it. I never have. I think the original recipe may say to cover it for, I've never done that. But it just goes straight in the oven like this, 400 degrees for 40 to 45 minutes. What you're looking for is when you put a knife down through it, you want the butternut squash to be tender because that's all you're doing. Everything else in here is cooked. Just kind of getting a nice sort of crust layer on the top, more or less, and then uh, you make sure the butternut squash is tender. Um, I mentioned this in passing earlier, uh, but if if you want something that will hold together nicely, um, I've never done it with this recipe, but I did another recipe, different style recently. Um, that was it was it did not did not have dairy in it for a lasagna type thing, and it called if you eat eggs, it called for some beaten eggs put over the top, and that actually makes it set. It's not eggy because you're only using two eggs in a, in, in a whole pan of similar size to this, but it really binds it together where you can have something that's easily slices. This, this stays together relatively well, especially if you let it cool for a few minutes before you serve it. Um, but it really is, it, 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 that adds one other element where it's more like a traditional lasagna without having all the dairy. That's it is if you eat eggs. It's not going to work with any sort of like vegan egg replacements. Um, so yeah, that just goes in the oven for 45 minutes. And when it comes out, this is, this is a, uh, forgot that uh, what I'm using here is a convection oven. I don't use a convection oven at home. So it's, it is a little, it's a little, it's a little brown on top, but uh, that's where your garnish of your Parmesan, your Via Life or your Ramajan would come in to, to make it a little more pretty. Also, Something I did not add to the sauce that you can do if you have it, but don't feel like you have to buy it if you don't, is some fresh basil in the sauce or some fresh basil to garnish is a really nice addition. It's not a requirement. About 90% of the time, I don't do that. But that is one of the things that is mentioned as an option in the sauce. And that's just three or four, a small handful of leaves just put in there when you blend it up. And then you could, you could do some, some chopped on top if you'd like, just for the garnish. Not, not necessary, but it's an option. All right, um, I think we've pretty much covered this dish as well as I can. And th the version that I did, this is the meat version that I did here. Um, so this, this uses the Italian sausage and the mushrooms, but the visual to you, especially this, this is the Okay, and The squash in here is nice and tender, so that, that's what you're looking for. Hmm. I should have gone for middle piece. That's what I'm going to do. Actually, it'll be easier for uh, for TV magic. And also, um, full full um, disclosure. Usually, I make this in a square pan. Um, I could not find either of my similarly squared pans at home. I don't know where they could have gone, but um, 
So it's a little easier to cut and present this when it's something square. But um, you can see that, you know, it, it's, a, it's it basically just looks, uh, it looks just like, like, you know, more or less like lasagna. Obviously it's a little more orange from the butternut squash, but you, you see those very clear layers in there. And it definitely would bind better if you chose to add a couple of eggs in there, or if you, add, if you, add, if you did use either, um, Kite Hill makes a really nice vegan ricotta that I think that would go great in here. If you wanted some creamy, more dairy elements to it, keeping it vegan or dairy ricotta, um, mm -hmm. be great in there. Um, if you if you wanted to keep it dairy free but have the egg component, I would do that on there before you did your top layer of tomato sauce. So that would go underneath the tomato sauce and then mm -hmm. toss on top. So that way you give the chance the egg to kind of get down through there and bind it together. But all that's unnecessary in my opinion. This is the way that I've eaten it for years. And uh, yeah, so that's that's pretty much it. I wish you were here to be able to, to try this with us and hopefully sooner than later, we can start having cooking classes here again where we can all be together. But for right now, this is what we got.